This video is brought to you by NVIDIA AI version 3, but more on them later. In 1979, a new tank was presented to the public in Israel. It was technologically superior to any competition with a capability to carry eight troops in full gear and armored like none other tank before. But what if I told you that all of that was a lie? This is a story about a tank that was made not to show off or to make any money or even as a technological demonstrator, but out of necessity. It was a tank designed equally to take and save lives and a tank that would be one of the pillars of Israel's existence. This is the Israeli iron chariot, the Merkula. The Merkula is a tank that was plagued by many myths, speculations and controversies. But to understand the story of this tank, it's absolutely critical to understand the story behind the IDF as a whole in the late 1960s. You see, back in the 1960s, the Israeli army, or the Israel Defense Force, wasn't the almighty technologically advanced superpower that we've seen flex their muscle today. Rather, it was an army of experienced soldiers with outdated and limited resources. The main tanks of the IDF were the Schott and Magrach three tanks, which were actually British Centurions and M48 patterns, respectively. And these were pretty out of date back then, so Israel was in talks with the Queen's finest to attain these brand new shiny British Chieftain tanks. These were state-of-the-art tanks aimed with 120mm guns to crush anything that the Arabs might send onto the battlefield. And in October of 1966, in secrecy, two chieftains were transferred to Israel for testing and evaluation. But a year later, everything would change. Now, this next piece of news is an absolute game changer. If you want to make videos like me, but you don't know where to start, then you need to use NVIDIA AI's new Game Changer Update version 3. And this is seriously cool. Unlike traditional video tools with steep learning curves that only solve for parts of your video creation process, like using Blender or Premiere Pro, NVIDIA is the creative partner that you've always wanted that removes all the friction, letting users focus entirely on their vision and their idea. NVIDIA enables you to express your ideas in a form of stunning videos, the kind you've always wanted to create in the most seamless, intuitive way possible, irrespective of whatever skill level you are at. For example, let's make a video about the best fighter jet in history. Boom, it's done. Is it speed? maneuverability. And if you want to make changes, such as using your own voice or perhaps even translating the whole video to Spanish, it's done with a click of a button. You can try NVIDIA AI for free, but if you want to use their generative capabilities, I highly recommend that you go for a generative plan that starts at $96 a month. It's the one that I have and it gives you the most bang for the buck with 15 generative minutes. And if you're already an NVIDIA user, you can simply go to the add-on section and buy more generative seconds. In 1967, Israel would launch a series of preemptive airstrikes and an armored blitz led by General Israel Tai over the Sinai Peninsula and would end up taking the whole area from the Egyptians. This war was known as the Six Day War and it made the Brits very, very angry. They ended up refusing to sell the chieftain to Israel or while the Arabs got a massive resupply of new tanks and equipment from the Soviets. USA would help Israel and they were able to obtain some M60 tanks under the designation Magak 6, but they still didn't have an edge over the Arab armies. On the other hand, even though Israel tank crews prevailed on the battlefield due to superior tactics and training, they still had significant losses during the war and General Tal started lobbying for a new domestic tank. But then their phone would call, and who would be on the line? Why, it's the British, who were cocky enough to even ask for an evaluation of the Chieftain tanks so they could improve their armor, which received, of course, a polite flip-off by the Israelis. The government wasn't eager to spend money on a new tank development, and Minister Moshe Dayan, as well as other voices in the government, asked about acquiring more American armor. The debate would rage on until the War of 1973. And this was a big turning point for Israel. The Yom Kippur War was a serious wake-up call for the Israeli government and the Israeli Defense Force. 
Arab countries attacked Israel simultaneously, and it was only due to the insane skill and sacrifice of the soldiers that they managed to defend and even turn the tide of war. However, the victory came at an extremely high cost. Out of 3,000 dead IDF soldiers, over 50% were tank crews, and in total, around 1,000 tanks were lost, damaged, or captured by the enemy. The IDF armored corps was decimated, and they even incurred even higher casualties to the enemy. General Tao, a tanker himself, was mad. He went to the government and said, hey, I'm going to personally take over the military development and that a new tank for Israel is now the project of highest priority. And thus, the Iron Chariot was born. The new tank would receive the name Merkula very early on in its development. And as you can probably already guess, this translates to chariot from Hebrew. Merkula was to be a tank like no other and the first modern tank to place the safety of its crew as the number one priority in combat. The general visited Western allies and their tank developments at that time, such as the German Leopard 2, the American XM1, and the French AMX 30 to analyze what improvements should be built into the Merkula project. Some stories say that Israeli intelligence managed to get a peek from a certain Eastern European country as well of the latest Soviet tank, the T-72, way before Merkula would face it off in eventual combat. So you might be thinking that this tank had all the latest and greatest in terms of tech at the time. Well, that's where it was really a contrary point. I have to remind you that this was Israel's first domestically developed tank and they didn't have access to technologies such as the composite armor that other countries were using at the time. And even the latest 120mm guns like the L44 from the Leopard 2 were unavailable to this beginning nation. Instead, they had to improvise. And now I'm going to play right into the stereotype of the Jewish culture when I say that the plan was to have the tank ready by 1979 but the Israeli engineers managed to complete the first prototype before the schedule and even didn't break the budget constraints, saving some money in progress. I swear to God, this joke wrote itself. Anyhow, on Israeli's Independence Day in 1979, the new tank was first shown to the public in a stadium in Jerusalem. Many military attaches from around the world were present just to see this new homegrown tank, and it was impressive. The sleek sci-fi looking design with a low profile narrow turret and seemingly heavy armor on the front was promising. Mind you, this was the best Soviet tank at the time and this was the M1. But that wasn't enough. 10 fully equipped soldiers exited from the rear door of the tank, making this not just a tank, but an APC as well. And the media just ate this up with a newspaper calling it the best tank in the world. But all of this was actually a farce. Merkula was never actually intended to carry troops, its armor was terrible, and it was underpowered and lacked a proper gun. Let me explain. The Merkula's design was very similar to what the Swedes were cooking at the time. For example, the engine was actually placed in the front of the tank, which would put it in harm's way of enemy projectiles, but it would protect the crew. And as we mentioned at the time, the IDF didn't have access to modern composite armor, like Chopin, so they had to improvise. And do you know what they used as armor? Diesel. Before you say I got something wrong there, diesel is actually quite good for stopping rounds. You see, unlike gasoline, diesel is really not that flammable. First, it needs to be compressed to become flammable, and second, it needs oxygen. So as long as it's not exposed to the elements and it's not compressed, it's a liquid like any other, and liquids are quite good at draining kinetic energy from projectiles. So Merkula's fuel tanks were quite cleverly distributed across the hull, with the main one in front of that engine in the front, and the side one spanning across the length of the crew compartment. Now, if you still don't believe me, you can go check out the Swedish STRV-103. You know, the crazy Nordic burger patty of a tank from the 1960s. Do you see those things on the side? Think it's like ERA or some other type of armor? No, those are jerry cans filled with diesel and they would use those jerry cans as armor on the Israeli tank. The inside of the tank was also quite spacious, and another crew safety feature was removing all the hydraulics from the turret. 
During the Yom Kippur War, a lot of casualties were due to burns, and hydraulic oil burns like a B-word. The ammo was also located in the back of the tank and placed into separate containers, so if in the worst case of fire or armor penetration, they would protect the ammo and the crew would have time to escape. Now, you see how the Merkula was never actually intended to use as an APC? There was simply no room for soldiers. The ammunition was stored there instead. Of course, that tank on the presentation had all of its ammo removed for the show-off, but in general, if you want to carry troops in the tank, you would have to remove all of the ammo and the shells, and then you don't have an effective tank anymore. So this desired feature, along with the rear door, had other functions. First, the crew had another way to escape the tank, and that way was rear words, not towards enemy fire, and the second reason was for easy ammo replenishment. Again, this was another lesson that was learned during the 1973 war. Crews would often use up their whole ammo complement, and then they would have to retreat to the rear to get resupplied. The idea behind the Merkula was a quick resupply near the front line, where the crew and the logistic guys would be protected and even had a tank providing cover fire if needed. The same tank they were resupplying. But we're far from over, because you see, the Merkula was also a quirky tank, and I bet Doug Demulo would have fun reviewing one. Do you remember how I said that this tank was underpowered? Well, the engine was a Teledyne Continental AVDS 1790 with only 908 horsepower. Because this beast was 61 tons, this would give it a terrible maximum speed. But this was fine because again, it was actually designed like this. General Tao wanted to not have a speedy light tank like the T-62, but instead have a well-armored, well-equipped tank with skilled crew for slow and tactical domination on the battlefield. The main gun of the tank was a sort of compromise as well, because the only available gun at the time was the British-designed M64 105mm gun from their M60 tanks. Because of how old it was, it was very soon to be obsolete in combat against T-72s who were sporting the latest 125mm guns, so upgrading the cannon for perhaps the version 2 of the Israeli tank was a high priority. But continuing on with the features with the Mark 1, the Merkula was one of the first tanks to also have anti-slip surface on both the turret and the chassis, to prevent shiny metal reflecting in the desert and injuries if the crew slipped. And lastly, this little fact is one of my favorites, the commander had a 60mm mortar at its disposal. If they located an enemy behind cover or blocked by a terrain configuration, they could simply pop the mortar out and shoot them regardless. And if you needed overwhelming firepower, there were also three FN Mag 58 machine guns on the tank with the four crew members that could blast anything away. As you can see, the Merkula was neither fast, armed with a superior gun, or armored with the latest armor, but the Merkula was still the best tank in the world. Well, at least for Israel. In 1982, the Merkula finally had its baptism of fire. Israel decided to deal with the Palestinian groups in Lebanon, and Merkulas led the armored spearhead towards Beirut. On the other hand, Syria, the traditional nemesis in the region, was expected to join in the war and fight, but the Israelis were more than ready for that. Now, the history of the Merkula versus the T-72 having a duel in the desert are questionable. Soviet historians say how the T-72s managed to destroy several Merkulas and had success in combat, with the Israeli and American historians often saying that the Merkula dominated the T-72s, sniping them from 3 or 4 kilometers away in most engagements. And as you know here at Found and Explained, we always try to strike the middle ground when there's two historically conflicting reports. But the truth is, in this actual fact, there wasn't actually a lot of direct combat between these two units during the war. Most of the Syrian T-72s were picked off by Israeli tow teams and helicopters. And there's only one instance where there could have been a direct combat between Israeli units with Merkulas and Syrian T-72s. And the fact is, from this engagement, the Merkula proved its worth in combat. Only seven tanks were completely lost, with only two crew members killed in combat in the entire battalion. The curse of the Yom Kippur War was lifted, and Merkula design proved to save lives of the IDF tankers. Only one Merkula was confirmed destroyed by enemy tank fire, and a way bigger issue than Syria tanks were actually RPGs, mines, and ATGMs. And soon after the war, namely in 1983, a major upgrade arrived for the Israeli chariot. 
The Merkula Mark II was built with the input from the crews of the first generation tank who had seen this actual combat experience. As we already mentioned, RPGs were a big issue and the Merkula was one vulnerable spot, namely at the back of the turret, because there was room for a rocket to detonate between the chassis and the back of the turret. So they made a very simple solution to the problem a series of heavy steel balls hanging on a chain which would detonate the warhead on impact, significantly reducing its energy and its ability to penetrate the armor. And this proved to be very effective. Additional armor plates were added to the chassis as well as the turret. The commander got a thermal sight and the fire control system was updated. So during the fighting at South Lebanon in the first Palestinian Infodata, Merkavala now had a completely new problem. It wasn't fighting tanks or vehicles at all, but most of the combat occurred in urban areas and enemy fighting guerrilla star warfare against the Israeli Defense Force. The issue was the engine. Although updated as well, it still only had 950 horsepower. And yes, the tank was still seriously lacking firepower with its 105mm gun. And even though the latest Merkvala Mark II variant, the Mark IId, had some serious armor upgrades with modular composite armor kits akin to one of its successors, it still wasn't enough and this was just an interim solution. Israel would need yet again a new tank. This new Merkvala tank would become the king of urban combat and support the evolving IDF combat doctrine in the future. However, Mark 3 and 4 are significantly different from the first two iterations and deserve a video for themselves. So please leave a like and comment if you'd like to see the continuation of this story and what happens next with the Israeli chariot. Thank you so much for watching and please, I know this is a very sensitive subject, so let's not get too political down in the comments. We're talking about a history and a past of an engineering topic that happened a long time ago. And I understand that these things are not made in a vacuum and the state of the world today can give us a different perspective of the engineering events of the past and what the thoughts and design ideas were behind them. So be safe and I'll see you in the next Found and Explained video.